Hatchet, Chapter 12 The fish spear didn't work. He stood in the shallows and waited, again and again. The small fish came closer and closer, and he lunged time after time, but was always too slow. He tried throwing it, jabbing it, everything but flailing with it, and it didn't work. The fish were just too fast. He had been so sure, so absolutely certain that it would work the night before. Sitting by the fire, he had taken the willow and carefully peeled the bark until he had a straight staff, about six feet long and just under an inch thick at the base, the thickest end. Then, propping the hatchet in a crack in the rock wall, he had pulled the head of his spear against it, carving a thin piece off each time, until the thick end tapered down to a needle point. Still not satisfied, he could not imagine hitting one of the fish with a single point. He carefully used the hatchet to split the point up the middle for eight or ten inches, and jammed a piece of wood up into the split to make a two-pronged spear with the points about two inches apart. It was crude, but it looked effective and seemed to have good balance when he stood outside the shelter and hefted the spear. He had worked on the fish spear until it had become more than just a tool. He'd spent hours and hours on it, and now it didn't work. He moved into the shallows and stood, and the fish came to him. Just as before, they swarmed around his legs, some of them almost six inches long. But no matter how he tried, they were too fast. At first he tried throwing it, but that had no chance. As soon as he brought his arm back, well, before he threw, the movement frightened them. Next, he tried lunging at them, having the spear ready just above the water and thrusting with it. Finally, he actually put the spear in the water and waited until the fish were right in front of it. But still, somehow, he telegraphed his motion before he thrust, and they saw it and flashed away. He needed something to spring the spear forward some way to make it move faster than the fish. Some motive force. A string that snapped, or a bow. A bow and arrow? A thin, long arrow with the point in the water and the bow pulled back so that all he had to do was release the arrow. Yes, that was it. He had to invent the bow and arrow. He almost laughed as he moved out of the water and put his shoes on. The morning sun was getting hot and he took his shirt off. Maybe that was how it really happened way back when. Some primitive man tried to spear a fish and it didn't work and he invented the bow and arrow. Maybe it was always that way. Discoveries happened because they needed to happen. He had not eaten anything yet this morning, so he took a moment to dig up the eggs and eat one. Then he reburied them, banked the fire with a couple of thicker pieces of wood, settled the hatchet on his belt, and took the spear in his right hand, and set off up the lake to find wood to make a bow. He went without a shirt, but something about the wood smoke smell on him kept the insects from bothering him as he walked to the berry patch. The raspberries were starting to become overripe just in two days, and he would have to pick as many as possible after he found the wood, but he did take a little time now to pick a few and eat them. They were full and sweet, and when he picked one, Two others would fall off the limbs into the grass, and soon his hands and cheeks were covered with red berry juice, and he was full. That surprised him, being full. He hadn't thought he would ever be full again, knew only the hunger, and here he was, full. 
one turtle egg and a few handfuls of berries, and he felt full. He looked down at his stomach and saw that it was still caved in, did not bulge out as it would have with two hamburgers and a freezy slush. It must have shrunk, and there was still hunger there, but not like it was, not tearing at him. This was hunger that he knew would be there always, even when he had food. A hunger that made him look for things, see things. A hunger to make him hunt. He swung his eyes across the berries to make sure the bear wasn't there, at his back. Then he moved down to the lake. The spear went out before him automatically, moving the brush away from his face as he walked. And when he came to the water's edge, he swung left. Not sure what he was looking for, not knowing what wood might be best for a bow. He had never made a bow, never shot a bow in his life. But it seemed that it would be along the lake, near the water. He saw some young birch, and they were springy, but they lacked snap somehow, as did the willows. Not enough whip back. Halfway up the lake... Just as he started to step over a log, he was absolutely terrified by an explosion under his feet. Something like a feathered bomb blew up and away in a flurry of leaves and thunder. It frightened him so badly that he fell back and down and then it was gone, leaving only an image in his mind. A bird it had been, about the size of a very small chicken, only with a fan tail and stubby wings that slammed against its body and made loud noise. Noise there and gone. He got up and brushed himself off. The bird had been speckled, brown and gray, and it must not be very smart because Brian's foot had been nearly on it before it flew. Half a second more and he would have stepped on it and caught it, he thought, and eaten it. He might be able to catch one or spear one. Maybe, he thought, maybe it tasted like chicken. Maybe he could catch one or spear one and it probably did taste just like chicken. Just like chicken when his mother baked it in the oven with garlic and salt and it turned golden brown and crackled. He shook his head to drive the picture out and moved down to the shore. There was a tree there with long branches that seemed straight, and when he pulled on one of them and let go, it had an almost vicious snap to it. He picked one of the limbs that seemed right and began chopping where the limb joined the tree. The wood was hard, and he didn't want to cause it to split, so he took his time, took small chips, and concentrated so hard that at first he didn't hear it. A persistent whine, like the insects, only more steady, with an edge of a roar to it was in his ears, and he chopped and cut and was thinking of a bow, how he would make a bow, how it would be when he shaped it with the hatchet, and still the sound did not cut through until the limb was nearly off the tree, and the wine was inside his head, and he knew it then. A plane. It was a motor, far off but seeming to get louder. They were coming for him. He threw down the limb and his spear, and, holding the hatchet, he started to run for camp. He had to get fire up on the bluff and signal to them, get fire and smoke up. He put all of his life into his legs, jumped logs and moved through brush like a light ghost, swiveling and running, his lungs filling and blowing. And now the sound was louder, coming in his direction. If not right at him, at least closer. He could see it all in his mind now, the picture, the way it would be. 
he would get the fire going and the plane would see the smoke and circles, circle once, then again, and waggle its wings. It would be a float plane and it would land on the water and come across the lake and the pilot would be amazed that he was alive after all these days. All this he saw as he ran for the camp and the fire. They would take him from here and this night, this very night, he would sit with his father and eat and tell him all the things. He could see it now. Oh yes, all as he ran in the sun, his legs liquid springs. He got to the camp, still hearing the whine of the engine, and one stick of wood still had good flame. He dove inside and grabbed the wood and ran around the edge of the ridge, scrambled up like a cat and blew and nearly had the flame feeding, growing, when the sound moved away. It was abrupt, as if the plane had turned. He shielded the sun from his eyes and tried to see it, tried to make the plane become real in his eyes. But the trees were so high, so thick, and now the sound was still fainter. He kneeled again to the flames and blew and added grass and chips, and the flames fed and grew, and in moments he had a bonfire as high as his head. But the sound was gone now. Look back, he thought. Look back and see the smoke now and turn. Please turn. Look back, he whispered, feeling all the pictures fade, seeing his father's face fade like the sound, like lost dreams, like an end to hope. Oh, turn now and come back. Look back and see the smoke and turn for me. But it kept moving away until he could not hear it, even in his imagination in his soul, gone. He stood on the bluff over the lake, his face cooking in the roaring bonfire, watching the clouds of ash and smoke going into the sky and thought, no, more than thought, he knew then that he would not get out of this place. Not now, not ever. That had been a search plane. He was sure of it. That must have been them, and they had come as far off to the side of the flight plan as they thought they would have to come, and then turned back. They did not see his smoke, did not hear the cry from his mind. They would not return. He would never leave now, never get out of here. He went down to his knees and felt the tears start, cutting through the smoke and ash on his face, silently falling onto the stone. Gone, he thought finally. It was all gone. All silly and gone. No bows, no spears, or fish, or berries. It was all silly anyway, all just a game. He could do a day, but not forever. He could not make it if they did not come for him someday. He could not play the game without hope. Could not play the game without a dream. They had taken it all away from him now. They had turned away from him. And there was nothing for him now. The plane gone. His family gone. All of it gone. They would not come. He was alone, and there was nothing for him. And that's the end of chapter 12. Hatchet, chapter 13. Brian stood at the end of the long part of the L of the lake and watched the water, smelled the water, Listen to the water, was the water. 
A fish moved and his eyes jerked sideways to see the ripples, but he did not move any other part of his body and did not raise the bow or reach into his belt pouch for a fish arrow. It was not the right kind of fish, not a food fish. The food fish stayed close in, in the shallows, and did not roll that way, but made quicker movements, small movements, food movements. The large fish rolled and stayed deep and could not be taken, but it didn't matter. This day, this morning, he was not looking for fish. Fish was light meat, and he was sick of them. He was looking for one of the foolish birds. He called them fool birds. And there was a flock that lived near the end of the long part of the lake. But something he did not understand had stopped him, and he stood, breathing gently through his mouth to keep silent, letting his eyes and ears go out and do the work for him. It had happened before this way. Something had come into him from outside to warn him, and he had stopped. Once it had been the bear again. He had been taking the last of the raspberries, and something came inside and stopped him. And when he looked where his ears said to look, there was a female bear with cubs. Had he taken two more steps, he would have come between the mother and her cubs. And that was a bad place to be. As it was, the mother had stood and faced him and made a sound, a low sound in her throat to threaten and warn him. He paid attention to the feeling now, and he stood and waited, patiently, knowing he was right and that something would come. Turn, smell, listen, feel, and then a sound, a small sound. And he looked up and away from the lake and saw the wolf. It was halfway up the hill from the lake, standing with its head and shoulders sticking out into a small opening, looking down on him with wide yellow eyes. He had never seen a wolf, and the size threw him, not as big as a bear, but somehow seeming that large. The wolf claimed all that was below him as his own, took Brian as his own. Brian looked back and for a moment felt afraid because the wolf was so, so right. He knew Brian, knew him and owned him and chose not to do anything to him. But the fear moved then, moved away, and Brian knew the wolf for what it was. Another part of the woods. Another part of all of it. Brian relaxed the tension on the spear in his hand settled the bow in his other hand from where it had started to come up. He knew the wolf now, as the wolf knew him, and he nodded to it, nodded and smiled. The wolf watched him for another time, another part of his life. Then it turned and walked effortlessly up the hill, and as it came out of the brush, it was followed by three other wolves all equally large and gray and beautiful, all looking down on him as they trotted past and away, and Brian nodded to each of them. He was not the same now. The Brian that stood and watched the wolves move away and nodded to them was completely changed. Time had come, time that he measured but didn't care about, Time had come into his life and moved out and left him different. In measured time, 47 days had passed since the crash. 42 days, he thought, since he had died and been born as the new Brian. When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down, gutted him and dropped him and left him with nothing. The rest of that first day, he had gone down and down until dark. He had let the fire go out, had forgotten to eat even an egg, had let his brain take him down to where he was done, where he wanted 
to be done and done to where he wanted to die. He had settled into the gray funk deeper and still deeper until finally, in the dark, he had gone up on the ridge and taken the hatchet and tried to end it by cutting himself. Madness, a hissing madness that took his brain. There had been nothing for him then, and he tried to become nothing, but the cutting had been hard to do, impossible to do, and he had at last fallen to his side, wishing for death, wishing for an end, and slept, only didn't sleep. With his eyes closed and his mind open, he lay on the rock through the night, lay and hated and wished for it to end, and thought the word, Clow down, clow down, through that awful night, over and over the word, wanting all his clouds to come down. But in the morning, he was still there, still there on his side, and the sun came up, and when he opened his eyes, he saw the cuts on his arm, the dry blood turning black. He saw the blood and hated the blood hated what he had done to himself when he was the old Brian and was weak. And two things came into his mind. Two true things. He was not the same. The plain passing changed him. The disappointment cut him down and made him new. He was not the same and would never be again like he had been. That was one of the true things, the new things. And the other one was that he would not die. He would not let death in again. He was new. Of course, he had made a lot of mistakes. He smiled now, walking up the lake shore after the wolves were gone, thinking of the early mistakes, the mistakes that came before he realized that he had to find new ways to be what he had become. He had made new fire, which he now kept going using partially rotten wood because the punky wood would smolder for many hours and still come back with fire. But that had been the extent of doing things right for a while. His first bow was a disaster that almost blinded him. He had sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. Then he had spent two days making arrows. The shafts were willow, straight with the bark peeled, and he fire hardened the points and split a couple of them to make forked points, as he had done with the spear. He had no feathers, so he just left them bare, figuring for fish they only had to travel a few inches. He had no string, and that threw him until he looked down at his tennis shoes. They had long laces, too long, and he found that one lace cut in half would take care of both shoes, and that left the other lace for a bowstring. All seemed to be going well until he tried a test shot. He put an arrow to the string, pulled it back to his cheek, pointed it at a dirt hummock, And at that precise instant, the bow wood exploded in his hands, sending splinters and chips of wood into his face. Two pieces actually stuck into his forehead, just above his eyes, and had they been only slightly lower, they would have blinded him. Too stiff. Mistakes. In his mental journal, he listed them to tell his father, listed all the mistakes. He had made a new bow with slender limbs and a more fluid, gentle pull, but could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was, in the end, surrounded by a virtual cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He would pull the bow back, set the arrow just above the water, and when the fish was no more than an inch away, release the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him that the arrow had gone right through the fish, again and again, 
but the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he stuck the arrow down in the water, pulled the bow, and waited for a fish to come close. And while he was waiting, he noticed that the water seemed to make the arrow bend or break in the middle. Of course, he had forgotten that water refracts, bends light. He had learned that somewhere in some class, maybe it was biology, he couldn't remember, but it did bend light. And that meant the fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below, which meant he had to aim just under them. He would not forget his first hit. Not ever. A round-shaped fish with golden sides, sides as gold as the sun, stopped in front of the arrow and he aimed just beneath it at the bottom edge of the fish and released the arrow and there was a bright flurry, a splash of gold in the water. He grabbed the arrow and raised it up and the fish was on the end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling, held it and looked to the sky and felt his throat tighten, swell, and fill with pride at what he had done. He had done food. With his bow, with an arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food, had found a way to live. The bow had given him this way, and he exulted in it, in the bow, in the arrow, in the fish, in the hatchet, in the sky. He stood and walked from the water, still holding the fish and arrow and bow against the sky, seeing them as they fit his arms, and they were part of him. He had food. He cut a green willow fork and held the fish over the fire until the skin crackled and peeled away and the meat inside was flaky and moist and tender. This he picked off carefully with his fingers tasting every piece, mashing them in his mouth with his tongue to get the juices out of them, hot, steaming pieces of fish. He could not, he thought then, ever get enough. And all that first day, first new day, he spent going to the lake, shooting a fish, taking it back to the fire, cooking it and eating it, then back to the lake, shooting a fish, cooking it and eating it, and on that way until it was dark. He had taken the scraps back to the water with the thought they might work for bait, and the other fish came by the hundreds to clean them up. He could take his pick of them, like a store, he thought, just like a store, and he could not remember later how many he ate that day, but he thought it must have been over twenty. It had been a feast day, his first feast day, and a celebration of being alive and the new way he had of getting food. By the end of that day, when it became dark, and he lay next to the fire with his stomach full of fish and grease from the meat smeared around his mouth, he could feel new hope building in him not hope that he would be rescued. That was gone. But hope in his knowledge, hope in the fact that he could learn and survive and take care of himself. Tough hope, he thought that night. I am full of tough hope. And that's the end of chapter 14.